Good morning, and welcome to worship at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. I'm Frenchie McGee, Associate Pastor, and it's a joy to welcome you to this worship experience today. You know, Hennepin is located in downtown Minneapolis, but thanks to the gift of technology, we are in worship with those of you around the corner, around the street, and around the world. It's a great gift to all of us, especially during this time of social distancing, or as I prefer to call it, compassionate, caring withdrawal. Today is a special Sunday at Hennepin. We'll recognize and celebrate our high school graduates, and we also recognize our Hennepin scholars. Later on in the service, you'll have an opportunity to meet both of these extraordinary groups of young people. Right now, I'd like to invite you to sign the digital worship pad if you haven't done so already. There's also a bulletin available for you to follow along in this morning service with hymns and prayers. And after worship today at 1130, please come to the virtual coffee hour. You'll see people you haven't seen perhaps in a few weeks, and you might even see some new faces and make some new friends. It's a wonderful day to worship, and I invite you now to set aside your cares, open yourself to God's Spirit, and enter into this worship experience with heart, mind, and soul. Welcome to worship at Hennepin. Please join me in our responsive call to worship. We gather today in a spirit of hope. We are here together to remember God's light. There have been times when we have felt helpless. There are times when we have felt weak. Together, we are joined with one another and joined with special bonds to our neighbors and the world. Together, we hope for a better future. Together, we hope for love and kindness. We gather today in a spirit of hope. Today we worship in the brilliance of God's light and live our lives in faith and glory.
us pray a prayer confession as we share our real selves with God who loves us first, who loves us best, and who loves us always. Let us pray. Loving God, you see us as we are and know our inmost thoughts. We confess that we have not always seen or acknowledged your gracious care. We forget that all life comes from you and that to you all life returns. We have not sought to do your will and your with our whole hearts. We have not lived as grateful children nor loved others as Christ loved us. Apart from you, there is no life and only your grace can truly sustain us. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us, heal us, and make us whole. Set us free and restore us to the joy of your salvation now and forever. Let's continue in silence. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. God is continually seeking us and loving us and is freeing us for the lives that we were created for. The Holy Spirit is at work within us and is a continual source of hope. Receive in the name of Jesus this life, which is new every morning. Amen. Every year, as graduation day approaches, we take a few moments to celebrate graduating class. We would be remiss this year not to take a moment to recognize the fact that this year's graduating class is facing challenges that no class before it ever has. When we think about graduation, we often think about transition, maybe even a joyful departure for people away from a community that they've participated in, or a way of life that they've known. Today's current circumstances have taught us a day at a time that the importance of continued community is vital. 
which is why we are starting a new life group on June 7th for students between the ages of 18 and 24. If you're interested in being a part of that group or know someone who might benefit from being a part of that group, I invite you to visit haumc.org slash young adults for more information. I invite you to think of them not as people who are departing your community, but rather to lift them up in prayer and in celebration as we continue our journey together. Let us pray for our graduates now. Loving and holy God, we thank you for these young men and women who are ready now to go into the next season of their lives. They have worked hard. They have learned well. And you have guided them along the way from the beginning when they began school and kindergarten until this point now where they celebrate this great accomplishment of finishing their high school studies. God, we give you thanks for their parents and for their teachers and for other adults who have been in their life to encourage them and cheer them on, to guide them and to help them to take those next steps each year. All those steps that have led us to this day where we celebrate these great accomplishments and with great anticipation look forward to a wonderful future. God, we acknowledge that this is not how we had hoped it would be. We grieve that we cannot gather together for our commencement. We grieve that we are not able to have graduation parties that we have planned for for many years. God, comfort our spirits. Be with us and each graduate. Help us to see that you are with us and that you celebrate this, this special day and that we will be able to go on to have a future that will be fruitful and hopeful and that will bring light into the world. 
God, things are not always the way we hoped they would be, and yet you are able to bring beautiful things out of things that are so hard. So today we gather in thanksgiving for all that is and all that was meant to be and all that will be as we place ourselves in your care and follow your lead into a season of hope and newness. We pray with thanksgiving and with great hope in the name of the Christ. Amen. Just joining us, welcome to worship at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. Here are a few things I'd love to share with you about our life together, which is still vibrant and vital even during a time of pandemic. On June 7th at 1130, we'll hold our church conference to elect leaders for the 2020-2021 serving year. All members of the congregation are eligible to vote and the meeting will be held virtually and by conference call. You'll receive more details in the next few days, so keep abreast of Hennepin Happenings. Today, after worship, please stay for the virtual coffee hour. You can see old friends and perhaps make new friends. It's a space where we can catch up with each other and hear how we are to strengthen our connections. The virtual coffee hour lasts for an hour but if you don't have a full hour to stay, come and stay as long as you can and simply enjoy saying hello to people. Now, let's enjoy the rest of worship. Hi everyone, and welcome to Graduation Sunday. I know that many of you have different types of graduations that you have been thinking about either not happening the way that you thought they would happen, or maybe being disappointed in the way that they're happening. And it made me think of all of the different ways that we graduate. I went ahead and grabbed some things from my house and um, I'll show you some of the things I grabbed. So this is Rebecca's preschool graduation diploma. So that happened. And then I looked at I found another thing of Rebecca's. This was her eighth grade middle school orchestra graduation. And I found Sean's high school graduation. The diploma is actually in here, so there it is. I borrowed this from Sean's last year of graduation. I think I look great in it, thank you. Um, I also found that they're not always school graduations that we think about. So for example, when I was looking at our graduation things in our house, I found when Sean graduated from Boy Scouts, and that is something called an Eagle Scout. And this is all very blingy and fancy, but that showed that he did a lot of work and completed a very large project to be considered a graduate of all of Boy Scouts. Then I went into our office and I found my husband's college, I have to stand on my tippy toes to be able to see this, um, my husband's college graduation diploma. It's written in Latin, so if you didn't understand what it said, I think that's okay. Um, incidentally, I would like to point out, I did graduate from some things myself. I could not find any of those diplomas to save my soul. They're probably at my mom's house. But anyway, I kind of was thinking about all these different graduations and how we might be feeling excited about them or how we might be feeling anxious about moving on to the next thing. And it made me think, how can we look at this in a little bit different and bigger picture type of way? And so I started to think about Jesus. 
and how there's one story about Jesus when he's 12 years old and he goes to the temple. And it took a little bit more research for me to learn that this would have been potentially about the age that Jesus would have been having a graduation. So even way back in Jesus' time, there were graduations from different levels of school. And we know that because Jesus was called a rabbi, that he would have graduated through all of the levels that they had available as far as teachers in his time. And so what does it mean for us to know that Jesus had graduating opportunities, just like we have graduating opportunities? And I thought about with Jesus, how even though he was born as the son of God, because he lived a human life, Jesus still needed to learn things about himself and about the world that he lived in so that he would be ready to be the best teacher that he could. And as we look at all of these different graduations that we have from preschool and from middle school and high school and college and even people that go on to be doctors and lawyers and they graduate from those things, these are all of the ways that we become more and more ready to be the person that God really wants us to be. And we keep learning all the way through our lives and keep graduating from different things all the way through our lives. So if this is a graduation time for you, I hope that you are excited about what you have accomplished and I hope that you are excited about how you are going forward. And for the rest of us, I hope that we'll all take a couple of minutes and think about all of the things that we have graduated from and know that we are continuing to take steps forward in becoming the people that Jesus wants us to become. Let's pray. Dear God, we are blessed that we have opportunities to continue to learn and grow and become the grown-up people that you want us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you soon, okay? Bye-bye. It is good to share signs of peace with one another. And so turn to your neighbors and say, may the peace of Christ be with you. And then respond, and also with you. May the peace of Christ be with all of you. The scripture reading this morning is from the letter to the Romans, Romans 12, verses 9 and 10, and 14 through 21. I'll be reading from the contemporary English version. Be sincere in your love for others. Hate everything that is evil and hold tight to everything that is good. Love each other as brothers and sisters and honor others more than you do yourself. Ask God to bless everyone who mistreats you. Ask God to bless them and not to curse them. When others are happy, be happy with them. And when they are sad, be sad. Be friendly with everyone. Don't be proud and feel that you are smarter than others. Make friends with ordinary people. Don't mistreat someone who has mistreated you. But try to earn the respect of others and do your best to live at peace with everyone. Dear friends, don't try to get even. Let God take revenge. In the scriptures, the Lord says, I am the one to take revenge and pay them back. The scriptures also say, if your enemies are hungry, give them something to eat. And if they are thirsty, give them something to drink. This will be the same as piling burning coal on their heads. Don't let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you again in the name of Christ. Let's pray. O oh, great love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and all beings. Help us become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens and the weight of glory. 
Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of our world. And in these moments of shared worships, we pray that our intentions, our ideas, our words, and our prayers might be aligned with your intentions and your heart. That there might be life, and life more abundantly for all people. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who shared life with us, and who shares life with us now through the Spirit. Amen. Like you, I listened intently on Wednesday to Governor Walz's remarks as he outlined the plan to guide us through the next stage of living with and living in a time of pandemic. It was refreshing to hear his clear, concise communication as he spoke from what seemed to be a compassionate place, recognizing that this pandemic has really disrupted and upended our lives and offering practical suggestions for ways that we could continue to care for one another while we remained safe. Stay safe, Minnesota, he kept saying. Stay safe. As we continue to think about those things here at Hennepin, our plans to worship virtually for the time being are still intact as we learn to craft a pathway back to being on site. It will take us time to know what it means to stay safe, Hennepin. And so I want to encourage you and say thank you for the way that you have embraced virtual worship and the virtual offerings that we have been able to do in terms of gathering. Thank you for coming each morning to Coffee with Judy, with Pastor Judy, and thank you for joining me at 8 o'clock at night for closings. Thank you for coming to the virtual coffee hour, and I hope you'll stay again for the virtual coffee hour today. And as we look toward 2020, as you know, our church conference offers us the opportunity to move forward with vibrant and vital ministry as we still find our way through this extraordinary, unprecedented season. So, stay safe, Hennepin. Stay strong, Hennepin. I was also struck by something else in Governor Walz's remarks, and it took me back to a childhood memory, one I'd like to share with you if you'll indulge me for a moment. You see, most of you know that I'm not a Minnesotan. By birth, I'm a Mississippian. And so last night, as I listened to Governor Walz's remarks about the state of Minnesota and its presence during the Civil War, I was drawn back to my sixth grade field trip. It was a milestone and a marker in many ways for us because sixth grade was when you left elementary school, of course, and moved on to junior high. It was an overnight trip, which meant that for some people it was the first time that they would be going overnight with friends other than their Girl Scouts. And it took us to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where there is a large national park. If you know your Civil War history, you know that the siege of Vicksburg on the Mississippi River, the bluffs there, was a, mile, was a milestone in the war. And the park is a very large park. It includes monuments to all the states who were part of the Union fighting force. And as Governor Waltz spoke on Wednesday, I remembered being at the park and looking at the monument for Minnesota. Of course, we all knew the capitals and we knew that Minnesota was the state, the land of a thousand lakes. But I have to say it never occurred to me as a sixth grader that I would be here in Minnesota sharing worship with you. What a privilege and what an interesting path. When I think of that path and this connection 
it helps me more and more to realize that the power of connection given to us as people of faith, as people of God, is one that transcends many of the barriers that we might erect for one another. I have the privilege of being the first woman of color to be pastor here at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. And it's a privilege that I treasure. It's one that has enabled me to see ministry and to stretch and grow in ministry as we grow together as a community. And it's one for which I give thanks every day. And when I think of that power of connection and the pathways, the ways that God weaves our life together as we explore our sacred journeys together, I'm struck by something I find in our text and by the ways that it lifts us and hopefully encourages us in these unprecedented times. I want to share the text again with you from the message by Eugene Peterson. Peterson writes, love from the center of who you are, don't fake it, run for dear life from evil, hold on to dear life, to good, be good friends who love deeply and don't quit in hard times. Be inventive in hospitality. Laugh with your friends when they're happy and share tears with them when they're down. Get along and don't be stuck up. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody and don't insist on getting even because God says, I'll do the judging. And don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Get the best of evil by doing good. What does any of that have to do with the power of transformation? And what does that have to do with how we respond to this virus which has upended our lives and challenged all of our structures, civic, religious, societal, political, and economic. Well, when we think of the word evil, many of us like to think of evil as a kind of spiritual force that is out there somewhere. There are some who even still hold to the Sunday school conception of evil as the devil somewhere with horns, planning and plotting things. But my friends, Evil, the kind of evil that can divide communities, the kind of evil that can distort our perceptions of one another, and the kind of evil which can prevent us from actually living together in peace and as the people of God is real. And it wears different faces. It wears different clothes, it has different language, but it is antithetical to the spirit of love and grace which we find in Paul's words and which we find in the gospel of Jesus that is offered to us. The gospel as Paul understood it and the gospel as presented over these two millennia is a gospel that calls all people to a life of being connected, a life of community, a life that transcends the barriers which we would erect to separate us from each other. And instead, it's one that allows us to sit next to one another, to find common ground, to find common desires, and to create a common good for all people. It's more than civic although it does involve civic behavior. It's more than political, although it may cause us to make certain political choices. It's more than economic, although it may ask us and cause us to make certain decisions about how we use our money. It is akin to being social, 
but it's more than what some would call social justice as a theoretical construct. It is social justice lived out as the real life, real time grace of God operating in the lives of real people like you and me. And it pushes back against the kinds of forces which leave marginalized people feeling as if they have no place to go, and which make us lament and mourn and cry yet again this week as we read the headlines of another killing, another death of an unarmed young black man in a community where he looked perhaps out of place. This week I received emails from several people who wanted to know had I seen the video of what happened to Armad Aubrey. I have not. And I don't intend to watch it. I don't need to watch the video to imagine the visceral horror which must have overcome him as he realized in those moments that he was going to lose his life. I don't need to watch the video to imagine the visceral pain when his family received the phone call letting them know that he had been killed. I don't need to watch the video in order to tap into my own feelings and concerns about members of my family who are young black men who may look out of place in communities where they are unfamiliar. And as a woman of color, as a minister of the gospel, I don't need to watch the video to mourn and to lament that yet again we find ourselves in a moment when we don't know how to answer these questions. What I do find myself looking for are answers beyond the simple. What I do find myself looking for and what I hope you are also looking for is the power of transformation and the power of connection that comes to us as people of goodwill who are determined to see social justice happen because it is social because we are social beings called to live together in community. And justice, because justice is what God says belongs to God's people. Justice, because justice is what God says that is the providence of God. And so when I think of this text, when I think of our circumstances, when I think of how we want to stay safe Minnesota, how we want to stay safe Hennepin, and how we want to transform the communities around us and go forward together, I am struck by the possibilities ahead of us. I'm struck with hope for what we can create if we are willing to live into the words of the text, if we are willing to love from our center, genuinely love from our center, if we are willing to open our hearts and open our lives so that God can bring people into them who may be different from us, yes, but who may offer us the opportunity for reconciliation and healing in ways that we never, ever imagined. I'm struck by the possibility of hope that we can actually begin to see transformation happen in our communities that some people have prayed for for a long, long time. This week I had a conversation with the director of our Dignity Center, the Dignity Center, Mary Martin. The Dignity Center has remained open during this time of sheltering in place 
And as I talked with Mary, I asked her, what are you most excited about? Where have you seen connection happen? Where have you seen the response of people? And what she shared with me, I want to share with you as you hear her now describe the power of connection that has occurred. The most um, amazing thing to me is the connection of the participants at the Dignity Center. Um, they they um, have modeled community um, from our dining room table and have moved it down to where we are um, working with individuals. We have opened up our basement. We have provided computers, um, access to coffee and water and hand sanitizer um, and such like that. And they sit down and they work with each other. They've helped each other with uh, applying for unemployment, for looking for um, jobs and uh, writing resumes. We provide a printer so that when they print off the computer and when we're down with the um, participants, their excitement and their uh, excitement may not be a really good word, but their, their relations with each other is very affirming in that community is where people are. We have different congregations and different congregation members of Hennepin that are donating masks. So if anybody wants to be making masks, we are a very uh, good distribution site. We pass out masks every day we're open. We're also receiving food. We have bakers. We have, we just partnered with Surly through Second Harvest Food Rescue, and they will be distributing meals to us, which we then in turn will distribute to 180, which is a halfway house for um, men exiting prison, which is on Clifton, which is a near neighbor. It's really exciting in envisioning that new path. Um, how do we take Dignity Center farther? How do we make a, a, a bigger connection? And uh, it's a challenge. And we've got people out there that are saying, hey, how can I get involved in this? And how do I train them? And how do we envision this? And how do we work together to, to make it happen? And uh, that's where my mind has been. In my conversation with Mary, and in her passion for the connection, there is a pure kind of love which makes this text that we look at today from Romans, not just ancient words on a page, but it allows it to be a living, breathing reality that you and I are helping to create as we share ministry together and as we commit to live together as the community of justice, as a transformed community willing to transform communities into places that are safe, hospitable, open, and loving for all people. And what's the result of that commitment? What can happen if we undertake this commitment to live together in this way? Well, here are some words from Dr. Vivek Murthy, former Surgeon General from his book, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. When he became Surgeon General, Dr. Murthy spent the first few months of his tenure on a listening tour going throughout the United States before he could define his platform. And here's what he says. We know that disconnection runs through issues like addiction and violence and anxiety and depression like nothing else. And underneath that disconnection and that isolation and that loneliness is pain. And while this loneliness and pain engenders despair and isolation, what we also know is that togetherness raises optimism and creativity. When people feel they belong to one another, their lives are stronger, richer, and more joyful, even in the midst of pain. 
My friends, when we think about the power of connection to heal us and to heal our communities, that is precisely the gift that you and I have been given. Regardless of our denominational connection, regardless even of our doubts and our questions about our faith, if we will commit to being people of good will, people who will undertake the challenge of remaining connected to one another through the gift of the Spirit and through the practical gifts of sharing space and time and energy and love with one another, then we will begin to belong to one another in a new way. We will begin to feel connected to one another so that each one of us feels stronger and richer and more joyful, not only in this time of pandemic, but beyond the pandemic into a time when we will see, hopefully, peace and joy in our communities. These things always come at a price, and the price that we will have to pay will be the willingness to live vulnerably with one another. The price we will have to pay will be the willingness to share our very selves with one another. The price we have to pay will be that price of becoming a community that will hold each other's burdens, even as we celebrate each other's joys. The price we have to pay will be whether we will cry together as much as we are willing to laugh together. I don't think the price is too high for the gift that we will receive. And I hope that as we worship together, not only today, but as we worship together in months to come, and as we carve out new pathways for us to be present to one another's lives, and as we carve out new spaces and new opportunities for us to offer good, that you will come to know that the price we are paying is a price that is well worth what we're getting. A community of people healed, transformed, energized, engaged, ready to see the new horizon of love and joy offered to us as we become one community for all God's people. Stay strong, Hennepin. Stay safe, Hennepin. Stay connected, Hennepin. Amen. Good morning, Hennepin. I'm Jack Fissler, Director of Legacy Giving. I invite you to join me in celebrating this year's Hennepin Scholars. For over 30 years, we annually have recognized outstanding scholars through endowed scholarship funds contributed by visionary Hennepin members. A total of $18,000 was awarded to assist with tuition costs for this year's group of 14 scholars. Four will be freshmen in college. The other 10 will be continuing their college programs. The awards assist students pursuing seminary, college or university programs or other professional degree or certificate programs. In 2021, these students will be attending institutions across the country, from Connecticut to California, Idaho and Montana, as well as Iowa and Minnesota, and pursuing academic programs ranging from theater arts, film, agribusiness, environmental studies, nursing, social work, and medicine. Our scholars have excelled in academics, music, drama, and sports, both in high school and college, as well as in leadership roles. At Hennepin, their activities have included mission trips, youth choir and youth council, as well as volunteering for vacation Bible school and Sunday school and serving community meals. As part of their applications, students submit 
personal essays about their educational and career goals. Each year, their comments have reflected not only their ambitions, but also their heartfelt interest in serving others and their appreciation for Hennepin's faith in their futures. One student so well noted that sentiment. Wherever life takes me, I find comfort in knowing that I always have the Hennepin community supporting me. Let's meet our 2020 Hennepin Scholars. wonderful Sunday to celebrate connection, the powerful connection that God has with us and that we share with the world. Today we celebrate our graduates and we celebrate all the ways that we can continue to support them as they go into this next season in their lives, doing whatever it is that God has called them to do. All your giving helps support those ministries that undergird and encourage one of our kids, our youth, our adults, and our seniors. So thank you for giving. It's important, and especially in these times. We know some of you are not able to give financially right now, but you do give of your time and your talent, and we give you thanks. We thank you for all the ways that you give and all the ways that you offer your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. So thank you for that. If you are able to give financially, we ask you to do that now by going to the website and clicking on haumc.org.give slash give and giving online. That's a wonderful way to give. If you'd like to give by text, there's information on your screen this morning about how you can do that. This is a new thing, so I want to share with you how that works. Put in the number and then add Hennepin with a dollar sign in the amount that you'd like to give and then follow the instructions that follow and it's very, very easy. We hope you'll try it sometime and then you should receive a text confirmation of your gift. I don't know if that's the way you want to give this morning, but whatever way you choose, we appreciate your gifts, and so does God. God can take those gifts and do some amazing and wonderful and miraculous things. So, in whatever way you give, of your time, your talent, and your treasure, thank you. Okay. 
rejoice both far and near. How can I keep from seeing? No storm can shake my inmost calm. Far to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from seeing? As we pray the following litany, listen to each scripture verse and also listen for God's word of hope for you. Join me in this repeating refrain. God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and the future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Loving God, we seek to walk in hope as people of hope. Serving the world you made, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. May we have justice to defend the poor and the weak, so the poor have hope and injustice shuts its mouth. God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. Give us your grace always to remember those who are in need and to stand alongside them so that the needy will not always be forgotten nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. God of the future, we wait in hope for you. You are our shield and help. We pray for those caught up in the present pandemic and economic struggle of the world, those afraid of the future, those whose hope is unraveling. May we be there for them and point them to a hope that will never fade away. God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. We pray for those facing illness in their own lives or in their family, those who keep watch in the night hours, those who keep vigil with their loved ones. May we hold them in our hearts, watching with them like sentries for the morning. God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. Mark us more and more as your people, and may your unfailing love rest upon us. O oh Lord, 
even as we put our hope in you. God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. But now, Lord, what do we look for? Our hope is in you. We pray for the church, the family of God in every nation and in every village, town, and city. We pray for those close to us in the faith and those who express their faith in ways strange to us. We pray that we may be one in these coming weeks and months and years. God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. We commit ourselves to walk with brothers and sisters and siblings in the way of God's mission. With God's help, we will continue to be people whose hope is in God, who is seen in our words and our actions together. God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope. We wait for the Lord, and in God's word, we put our hope. Our souls wait for the Lord more than centuries wait for the morning, more than centuries wait for the morning. O oh Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with God is full redemption. Verses from Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God will not grow tired or weary, and God's understanding no one can fathom. God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young people stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, and they will run and not be weary. They will walk and will not faint. God of hope, fill us with joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah.
Friends, as you go out into the world this week, some of you will face challenges. There will be joys and concerns. You may feel at times as if you are alone. When that happens to you, remember today's worship experience and remember the power of connection. And know that you are part of the people of God, that you are part of the community of Christ. And know that the peace of Christ, the joy of Christ, the strength of Christ, and the grace of Christ is yours. And may that knowledge encourage you, energize you, and sustain you, not only this week, but all the days of your life. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you.